invite you to open your Bibles to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 will be focusing on verses 25 through 28. Uh, this is the culmination of a series of messages through the book of 1 Thessalonians, and I hope that this has been a very encouraging book and one that has edified the church. We know that many people have come to faith in Christ even through this time, and we praise the Lord for his truth, his eternal truth. And we come to these final verses, uh, and the Apostle Paul, uh, as he this morning, as we examine, presented the blessing to the people, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful and also will do it. And then he moves from that blessing to the benediction. Uh, closing of a letter or closing of uh, speech or closing of conversation is always important. You don't want to leave people hanging. You always want to try to share the things that are most pressing upon your heart. And indeed, the Apostle Paul does that in the concluding verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 25 through 28. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And may the Lord bless his word. You may be seated. The benediction that Paul writes is one that grows out of a relationship that he had with this church. They were very familiar with the Apostle Paul. He had been a part of planting this church. They had heard the call, come to Macedonia and help us, as we read in the book of Acts. And Paul, under the leadership of God, immediately went to Macedonia, and there they planted this work. Many others came to be a part of this work, those who came led by the Lord and under the, under the direction of Paul to invest in the life of the people in this very strategic region known as Macedonia, with the chief city being Thessalonica. And as Paul spent time with them, he instructed them, he loved them, he encouraged them, he taught them, he invested his life in their life because indeed for this church not only to be planted but for this church to thrive, it was important that there be that spiritual head and that spiritual leader who would spend time with them, encouraging them, teaching them, and instructing them in the ways of the Lord. And so as he comes this benediction, people pay attention to what he has to say. It's not just simply somebody that they've never seen, that they've never heard, who just showed up one week or for a couple of weeks, maybe preached revival, headed out of town, and now he's riding back and saying, this is what I think you ought to do. No, he is riding as someone who had established relationships with the people. And as he instructs them in the this benediction, they are going to listen because they know that his heart was holding their heart and his love was for the people and that he would tell them or teach them nothing that would point them astray or that would hinder them in their work and in their advance as a church of the living Lord Jesus Christ. And so this benediction is one that is relational. The apostle speaks out of that commitment that he had to them and out of the friendships that he had established with them and out of the fellowship of the body of Christ, brothers and sisters now in the Lord who once were lost in sin, who now have been redeemed by the Lord who are a part of this local gathered body, this body of believers in Thessalonica and to the church, he writes this wonderful benediction. And he has that authority not only as an apostle, but also as one who has spent time with the people. Relationships are always critically important in the work of the church. But he also calls them in this benediction to a response. Each of these has a response. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So be it. And so as he writes this benediction and he says, these are the things that are important to me. These are the matters that are on my heart. Hear them out of my heart. Hear them out of my love. There are certain responses that I want you to consistently be about within the church. There are things that you must do, things that we must continue doing if we're going to move forward and thrive as the body of Christ. And so this benediction tonight is one that is very encouraging to me, and I pray indeed very encouraging to you. A benediction is an ending, but yet we know that this was not the final word of instruction because we look forward and we see 2 Thessalonians. Paul continued to write to them, but at this point in this letter, these are the things that Paul had upon his heart. 
These are the words that grew out of his relationship with the people and the responses that he is calling upon them to make before the Lord and among one another. And so what are those responses? Indeed, he has already challenged them in verse 17 of this same chapter to pray without ceasing. Throughout this passage, Paul has spoken about this issue of prayer. There were times that he just said, pray for us. There were times that he just said, pray. And then we come to 2 Thessalonians, we find that there's greater, there's a greater specificity about the type of prayer. He has asked him to pray in 1 Thessalonians, and then in 2 Thessalonians, he is going to give them the exact way in which he desires for them to pray. And so prayer was an integral part of the life of this church as it is for our church. Pray is an integral part in the life of these believers as it is for us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he encourages them to pray. Brethren, pray for us. Brethren is an inclusive statement. He is asking the body. He is asking the church to pray. To pray in a very individual way for us. Indeed, we need to be very specific in our prayers. An accessory prayer That prayer where we come and we bring our petitions before the Lord has those very focused manners. It's one thing to gather together and say we pray for the sick, we pray for the missionaries, we pray for the peoples of the earth, we pray for the city that we live in, we pray for the state, we pray for our nation, we pray for the continents. It's one thing to pray in that very general way, but yet here Paul is telling them to pray in a very focused way, in a shotgun, not not in a shotgun fashion, in a rifle fashion, very clearly For one thing, pray individually. Brethren, pray for us. And so tonight, as we consider this benediction, we are called to pray. We are the brethren. We are the brothers and sisters in the Lord. And prayer must be always at the foundation of who we are and what we are about as the people of God. As we have shared the very five focuses that we have to move to the next level as a church by the year 2020, one of those matters is prayer and fasting. And we have encouraged our church to spend one day a month in fasting in whatever way God leads you to do that. But yet as we consider prayer, we are to pray without ceasing. Every day we need to pray for the ministry of this church. Every day we need to pray for the leadership of this church. Every day we need to pray for the fellowship of this church. Every day we need to be in prayer in a very focused way about what God would have us to do as his people. Because we know so often The disciples seemed to be quite inept in what they did. And they would come to Jesus and they would say, why can we not do this? Lord, we saw you do great and mighty things and we're with you every day. Lord, we're around the spiritual. Lord, we're handling the holy. Lord, we're seeing you and we see what you do. And then we go out and we try to do things in your name. But Lord, there just doesn't seem to be the same power, the same presence and the same impact and the same influence upon our works that we are about. And Jesus quite often taught them these things, this kind, only comes through prayer and fasting. And so when the apostle speaks this benediction and he calls upon them to pray, he understands the critical nature of prayer. He understands that he is a product of prayer This individual who was persecuting the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This individual who was seeking to wipe out the name of the Lord himself because people prayed. He was brought to that saving knowledge and that saving relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just a few days ago, I was in a meeting and there was a group of guys around the table and they were talking about different things of ministry. And many of them asked me about our church. And they remembered years ago when we had visitors on Sunday for quite a few weeks, those people who were protesting the things that were going on in our community and focusing it toward our church. And they asked, whatever happened to that adult entertainment facility in Brandon? And so I kind of pushed back and I said, well, I would like to be able to say that the churches just got together and we rallied and because of what we did, that place shut down. I said, but unfortunately, I can't say that that's what happened. I said, but let me tell you what I believe happened. What I believe happened was that every time moms and dads pulled up in their automobile and the red light stopped them at Highway 60 and Mount Carmel, their children in the back said, Mom, Dad, what's that place right there? And parents told their children, this is a place 
where women are not treated right. This is a place that does not honor the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a place that you don't need to be in and we don't need in our community. And I had more mothers tell me that when they would stop there, that their children would pray to the Lord about that place. Now, we all know it's not there anymore. And I do believe that it came because children prayed and God moved. We never know what God will do through the prayers of his people. We never know what we have missed in God's kingdom's work because we have been prayerless rather than prayerful. And so as Paul speaks to this church and he is challenging them and encouraging them to move forward as a church, he very clearly says, if we are going to be what God wants us to be, we must be people of prayer. Brethren, pray for us. That's an individual, an individual response. It's an inclusive commitment that we must make to be people of prayer. But then he moves forward. He says, greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I've always kind of been a little fearful of that text, to be honest. I'm a, I'm a little more, you know, in line with a holy hug or a hearty handshake. I'm not, I'm not as big on the holy kiss. Uh, but I have people who quite, quite often, you know, every week they give me a kiss. And, and that's fine. I mean, it's on my cheek. I go home with makeup all over my white shirt, you know, on Sunday morning. And Karen gets it. And that's all fine. But, but what this is about is fellowship. It's about fellowship within the body. I mean, we can have everything in place. And we can have every program just spinning at, at, at warped speed. And we can have budgets that, that are, you know, reaching new heights. And we can have visions and dreams about where God wants us to go. And we can put all of that out on the table. But if we miss the component of fellowship, then we'll never be the body that together can do what God wants us to do. Is that not the genius of the Southern Baptist Convention? cooperatively we work together we can do more together than what any one of us can do individually we can do more together as churches than any one of us can do on our own and so as we see that not only from a corporate understanding of the entire body of the fellowship of churches together how critical it is in the individual church that we have and we foster an atmosphere of fellowship at all times we must understand how critical fellowship is and Paul did, and he just said, look, when you see somebody, you greet them with a holy kiss. If that's not fellowship, I don't know what is. I mean, if that's not just kind of putting down all the bears and saying we're all here together, no one is more important than someone else, greet one another, greet the brethren with a holy kiss, greet those that are around you, let them know that you love them, let, you know that, let them know that you care for them, let, let them know that you value them, let them know that all of us together can do what God wants us to do, but none of us individually can accomplish what God intends for the body to accomplish as a whole. And so fellowship is critically important in the life of a church. And there are two components of fellowship that are found within this text. The first one is hospitality. The church should model hospitality more than anywhere that we ever go. At any place that we ever enter, hospitality should be the hallmark of a church. I remember a few months ago when Dan Cathy from Chick-fil-A was here speaking on a Wednesday night. I remember one of the things that he talked about for Chick-fil-A he said, we want to go the second mile. Now, this is a chicken place, you know. And we're just going to go the second mile. And when people come in, we, we want to go beyond customer service, customer satisfaction, customer appeal. And you see the things that they do. I mean, a mom can now drive through, you know, the, the little squat box thing and place her order and say, I'm coming in. And they'll have it at the table when the mom goes in. They, they got rid of the plastic flowers. Now they have live flowers on their table. People come around, they take your empty cup, and they'll say, what do you want? And they'll take it, and they'll fill it up. When you say thank you, they'll always say what? That's right. Some of you go to Chick-fil-A. It's my pleasure. You see, that's going the second mile, and that's just hospitality. And, and when people come to the 
church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the place of, uh, of grace and mercy and love, the place of help and hope, the place of salvation, the place where the Redeemer, the place where the eternal is established in the very place of God through Christ Jesus the Lord Himself. Should we not go beyond the second mile to as far as we need to in hospitality and loving people, caring for people, reaching out to people, including people in the body and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hospitality, that's part of what Paul is calling the church to do in this benediction. But he also reminds them that there always has to be that element of holiness. This isn't frivolous. You know, th- th- this isn't something that you're doing for personal gain. This isn't saying I'll go there because if I go there, I can create more clients. If I go there, I can have a better business. If I go there, I can have a better place. to. No, this is saying we are here for spiritual reasons and for spiritual purposes alone. And when we come together, we're all equal in the eyes of God. We're sinners saved by God's grace and by God's mercy. And when God looks down upon us, he doesn't see color. When God looks down upon us, he doesn't see economics. When God looks down upon us, he doesn't see the the place that we have in society. When God looks down upon us. He doesn't see position. When God looks down upon us, he sees sees the sons and daughters who are redeemed and cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. And we come together in that holiness that only is affected in our life through that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And that holiness should always be evident in our hospitality toward one another. And so here he says, greet all the brethren. And don't miss all, because some of us greet some. Some of us will greet the people that are seated right around us. And usually that greeting is, you know you're in my seat, would you move? <laughs> some of us will greet people that we're comfortable in greeting. Some of us will greet people that are like us. But Paul says at the church, There's a holy hospitality. And there's a sacred fellowship that we have. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. Probably one of the most precious moments that I've had in recent years at this altar. It was a Sunday morning. A family joined our church and they had a special needs son. It was during the 1030 hour. And he is just a very loving, trusting, outgoing, he likes to hug, he likes to kiss young man. And when I introduced them, he just grabbed me and hugged me and he kissed me. Not once, but twice, but three, but four. I mean, I was kind of like, okay. (laughs) But, you know, it was just such a humbling moment to realize God's love for all and God's care for all. And just how when we come together... Man, we've got to love each other in the name that's above every name, that of Jesus Christ our Lord. So greet the brethren with a holy kiss. And then he speaks about the word of God. Remember, he is talking about relational and responsive matters. Relational in that it is the very Holy Spirit of God that is breathing into his life these words. And as he holds that pen in hand, these words are being put down on the very parchment. And as he writes these words, they'll be rolled up and they'll be sealed and they'll be delivered by Sylvanus or by Timothy here to the church. And when they open them up, they're reading them knowing that these are words from Paul, the one who has been here to plant this church. But yet these are words that God has breathed into his life. And so Paul says, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. I mean, we have to be people who keep our focus upon the word of God. We must read the word of God. We must respond to the word of God. That's exactly what he's asking them to do. Read it. Read it to the holy brethren. It's a charge. It's a command. It's a commission. It is the word that he has given to them because he knows that when they open this word and they read this holy word. I mean, isn't it amazing to think that we are here tonight in the year 2013 and we're just reading three verses that over 2,000 years ago, a church in Thessalonica, a group sitting around opened up and they read these very words. Isn't that amazing? And that's the power of the word of God. That is the relevancy of the Word of God. The Word of God will stand forever. And Paul is saying, 
read this word, respond to this word. I mean, he has given them so many things dealing with their personal conduct, dealing with their faith, dealing with purity, dealing with the, the order within the church, dealing with the coming of the Lord, dealing with the judgment and the day of the Lord, dealing with just practical matters. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Abstain from every form of evil. Read the holy book to all the brethren. Because it is this book, it is these, this word that changes our lives in the Lord. And so anytime we come together and we open up the scripture, we stand because this is God's word and it is to be honored and it is to be valued and it is to be heard and it is to be accepted into our lives. So we read in order to respond. And these are the instructions. These are the responses out of this relationship that Paul is asking of this church and even of our church tonight. But then we come to that last verse. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. I've tried to put myself often in the place of this church in Thessalonica. I've never been a part of, of just going somewhere where there was nothing and starting it from scratch as a church. I've always been called to go to existing churches. I've never planted a church and, and, it's, and, and, and I'm not sure what all is involved in that, to be honest. I know it requires tremendous commitment. I know it requires great sacrifice. I know it requires people supporting, people praying, churches coming along beside. As we are right now with the work in New Orleans, with the work in Montana, with the work in Miami, these are the things that, that, they, are, that they are about here in the New Testament. And he reminds them that everything that they are experiencing is all because of grace. But you know, at one time, First Baptist Brandon was a church plant. I mean, we don't see it that way, but it was. In 1915, this church was chartered and established. But prior to that, there had been people meeting together, praying, thinking, dreaming, being led of God. I mean, and here we are now, 98 years into this church plant. I mean, that, that's pretty phenomenal. I mean, to think about in 1915, we weren't even on this site. We were, we were down in, in Valrico area, uh, close to the fish camp down there. And, 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 the, and the, Mr. Brandon gave this church a piece of property close to where the Mac is now. And they took a building from down there and they put it on sleds and with mules. They literally dragged that building here and set it up. And that's how the church came to this location in which it's found. And can you imagine that kind of faith? Can you just imagine that kind of trust? I mean, people today are moving out, and they moved in, <laughs> and then they came here, and praise God they did. I mean, here we are now, 98 years beyond that time, and we're at this place. That's grace. That's all it is, is just pure grace before God. I was looking earlier at the... Uh, little history book if you've never seen it it's available in the library it's, it hasn't been updated in quite a while it's written by uh, bill Strauss, and it kind of chronicles some of the history of the church and in, in just records and so forth and um, i just went through and counted the pastors <laughs> since 1915 some of them didn't stay very long Matter of fact, quite a few of them didn't in the early years. They were a year, two in one year, and so forth. But, but, but as I counted through them, uh, I'm the 45th pastor of this church. You know, that's not bad over 98 years, I guess. Uh, there's only been two pastors here since the year 1976. Dr. Beamer, who went on to be with the Lord recently, served this church from 1976 up to the mid-1990s. And then I had the privilege of coming here in 1996. And it's in March, in just a few weeks, I'll begin my 18th year here, which is hard to believe. It's hard to believe. I mean, it really is. No, I don't, I don't, no. I don't say that for applause. I just say that, that you are a people who are, have great patience and perseverance, I promise you. And I thank you for that. But you see, I, I, I read this, and I, and I think about what Paul is saying to this church, you know, you, you don't build relationships and you don't build trust and, and, and you don't build the work of the church just in a quick period of time. It's over time. It's over the years. 
It's over periods of time. And that was brought home to me pretty strongly this past uh, Thursday with the funeral that I officiated. Because I realized when I was standing and officiating that funeral that I had officiated the funeral of this dear lady's husband, of two of her sons, and now her. Over that period, over that period of time, just living life together, going through good times and hard times, going through celebrations and going through seasons of sorrow. That's what we do together as a church. And we only do it because of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as Paul gives this benediction, he reminds them that, that the gift of God within their life is their salvation and the gift of God is the grace that he freely lavishes upon them. And as a result of that grace that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ, they are able to know the goodness of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord, the blessings of the Lord, the bounty of the Lord, the benefits of the Lord. All of that is being experienced by this church because God led them to start that work. And now as they're growing within that work, they're facing all all the challenges that any and every church will face in a culture that opposes the very name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But they draw together and they pray and they, they, they greet each other in hospitality and fellowship and they focus upon the Word of God and they realize that we can only do what we do not because of us, not because of our wisdom, not because of our giftedness, not because of our intelligence, not because of our sheer will. We can only do what we do because of grace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this magnificent benediction, Paul says, always remember that you are a product of grace. We are a product of grace. And the church can only be the church because of the grace of God through Jesus Christ. Christ our Lord. And to that Paul says, Amen. And I believe our word tonight would be in total and full agreement. And would we together say, Amen. Tonight, in this time of invitation and response, it may very well be that as a part of this fellowship one or more of these issues has struck a chord within your heart. Maybe there hasn't been that deep and abiding commitment to prayer. Maybe your desire of fellowship has not been all that it needs to be. Maybe your commitment in the word of God is waning and lacking. And maybe the trusting of grace and the leadership of Christ has not been at the forefront of your own heart and life. And tonight God has just spoken to you as a part of this body. And he is saying, make those commitments. Hear that benediction that grows out of a relationship that calls us to respond. Hear those things and then commit to those areas within your life that the scripture would ask you to commit to. And I pray that you will tonight. It may very well be that there are those who are here tonight that God is leading to be a part of the fellowship, the very body of First Baptist Brandon. And indeed, we would, we would desire that, if that is God's will for you, for your family, and for your home. There is so much that we still must do. There's so much that God has for us to do. And this requires every person giving everything of their life unto the Lord under his grace for us to accomplish those things. And so maybe tonight God is guiding you into the life and fellowship of this church. And we would encourage you to come and to make that your commitment, and we'll receive you as we do new members. Then tonight, there may be those who are here who have never trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I can't think of more exciting ways than to begin any worship service than in baptism. And that is a public testimony of a personal decision to believe and to trust in Jesus Christ. We have seen that witness here. We have evidenced that testimony here tonight. And there may be those who are here who have never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And on this night, the Lord, out of his grace, is calling you unto himself. And you know that there is indeed a commitment that you need to make. You know that there is a decision that needs to be evidenced within your heart. 
And because he loves you, he's calling you unto himself. Come tonight. Come tonight and receive. Come tonight and accept the salvation gift of Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. Let's stand with every head bowed and every eye closed. Heavenly Father, we pray now for these moments of invitation. We ask, Lord, that we will hear as you speak to our hearts. We thank you for the privilege that we have had to study through First Thessalonians. And we have seen so many things from your holy word. And tonight, as we just focus upon these final thoughts and these final words, each of them, each verse in and of itself, require such depth of commitment. We place all of them together. We are reminded through them of how important every person who is a part of a, ch of a local church body is to the work of the church. So may we commit tonight to do our part to carry the share of the work, the ministry that the Lord has for each of us, to recognize that every person is important. He uses us all. And as we are here together in this fellowship, that we would commit uh, to prayer, to fellowship, to the scripture. We commit to understanding the gift of God's grace. Lord, tonight I pray for those who are here who have other decisions to make, that as these pastors gather here at this altar, that they will come, maybe just for a time of prayer, even this morning, just a sweet moment, the altar with the blessing. Maybe tonight there are some who even uh, God continues, has continued to speak into your heart throughout the day and, and you just like for a pastor to pray with you in that area and you come. And I pray, Lord, that there will be those tonight who will surrender their life unto you in salvation. And we ask and we commit this time to you and to your glory alone. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.